Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Gary, thank you. Thank you much. And, and Gary, one reason why I ask you to pray and others to pray besides me is I, I like to kind of normalize prayer and see that prayer is not something that you have to go to seminary uh, to do. Um, it's basically, you know, as Gary said, it, 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 think about, I was thinking about it like this the other day, I was thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you learn how to talk and listen to a friend? How do you learn how to talk and listen to, you know, your wife or your husband? Um, well, you, you, you try to get to know them, right? And you, you, you try to focus on them and who they are and what they're about. And you're honest about yourself, right? And I think that's, that's, kind, of, that's, that's kind of it with, with us in the Lord in prayer. Um, you know, focus on getting to know who he is, who you're talking to and who you're listening to. Um, and, uh, and be honest. Be honest. Gary, thank you. Thank you much. Well, I, I have, have some of you have ever been to Israel? I've never been. Have anybody been to Israel? Body has. Okay, come on, you have, yeah. Um, again, I've not been there yet, but people who have been there, and especially people who give tours there, say that, um, that, that this is just a must-see uh, view that you have to get of, of the old city of Jerusalem. That's the old city with the Temple Mount in the foreground, and that is the view of the old city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And uh, this is you know, where Jesus uh, had just crested the hill and was right up about someplace like this in the passage that, that Preston read for us earlier. As he's, uh, he's looking down and about to take the last two miles to come into the city, going down the hill there through the, the Kidron Valley and then up the hill uh, into, into the city. And, um, and what you want to picture is something like a, like a Fourth of July parade, you know, uh, maybe with, with a, a VIP congressman or better yet, a, a renowned general, you know, sitting in the back of somebody's sports car that's driving real slowly and he's kind of, you know, waving to the crowd and, of course, you know, throwing out candy too. You got to do that at parades, right? And, uh, but, but that's the kind of festive, you know, celebrative uh, atmosphere uh, that's, that's being described here as Jesus rides into, into Jerusalem. And he's coming in at the beginning of Passover, which, like our 4th of July, was a celebration of a nation's history and also its freedom. You know, it's celebrating how, how Israel was, was set free from bondage to slavery uh, in, in, in Egypt. But this time, something even more is happening. Something even more is going on. Because as Jesus, in the way that he rides into the city and then in what he does when he gets there, he's really, it's, it's like a demonstration. He's making this, this claim. He's challenging people to see and to celebrate not only what God had done to save his people in the past, but what he's doing now in Jesus himself to be saving them and saving people in, in generations to come like, like our own. This is the only time uh, in, in the Bible we ever see Jesus using any mode of transportation other than his own two feet. Um, he had come and, and his disciples and probably a big entourage of people had come from Galilee about 65, 70 miles already. And it's not like, you know, they've been walking and, and it's like, oh, I'm just too tired. I need to, need to hitch a ride for the last couple of miles. No, it's not, it's not that. Um, by coming on the donkey, he's making a statement, which Matthew highlights by referencing uh, that passage from Zechariah, who centuries before, when the Jews were in exile, was talking about a king who would come uh, that way into the city to claim his throne. And so here comes Jesus, by the same route, by the way, that David, a thousand years before, had come into Jerusalem when he was returning uh, from being exiled for a couple of years to, to claim his throne again. And even the way he gets the donkey is part of proclaiming his, his kingship. I mean, you know, just, just like in our day, you couldn't, you're not allowed to just go up to somebody's house and you know, take their car, take their bike, or take their donkey, right? That's stealing. You can't do that unless, unless you're the king, right? Or you're one of the king's ambassadors. You, know, you picture, uh, you picture you know, Andy's going home after church, and he goes out to his truck, and, and the Secret Service comes up and says, Mr. Bishop, we need your keys. President needs to make use of your vehicle, you know. Andy would probably wouldn't be too happy, but you wouldn't really have much of a choice, would you? You know, you'd be walking home. Um, well, somebody might give you a ride, but you know, now you'd be walking home. Um, 
But hence, hence Jesus' words here, right? Where he says, you know, if anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them. You know, the Lord, the Master, the Messiah King needs it. And he'll give it to you. In fact, in, in Mark's gospel, it says somebody actually did ask them that. And that's what they said. And they said, okay, here it is, right? Well, then you got those, those shouts of, of Hosanna, which is, is Gary told us, expression. It literally means, you know, God save us. Um, but it wasn't used so much as a petition like that. It, more, it was more used as just an expression of praise to God, as Gary, Gary was telling us. And then the, the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a quote from Psalm 118. Uh, Psalm 118 is the last of six so-called hallelujah psalms because they all begin with the Hebrew word hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. And, and these were the psalms that were sung every year at Passover. And so these psalms, these songs would have been on people's minds already as they saw Jesus coming in, kind of like the way you know, at Christmas time you have lines from Christmas carols that are kind of ringing around in your head already. And Passover is a celebration of what? Of, of how God through Moses delivered his people from slavery, from the rule of a tyrant. And, and, and central to that was the blood of lambs, right? Placed on, on the door frames of houses. And, and this isn't a for sure, but some of the scholars speculate that Jesus came into the city maybe at about the same time as thousands of lambs were being herded into the city to become the Passover sacrifices later in the week. Yeah, but even if that's not the case, even if that, that isn't the way it happens, it's not that, that obvious, you can see kind of all the, the, the tie-ins here. And it says the whole city was, was stirred. Um, and, the, and the Greek word there is seismos. We get seismic from it, like earthquakes, right? It's all shaken up. And uh, by the way, you might recall that um, back in Matthew chapter 2, it says that all of Jerusalem was stirred as well. Actually, I think the word is, is disturbed. The whole city is buzzing. Why? Because the Magi had come and said Jesus was born. Well, now some 30 years later, Jerusalem's all shaken up again because of this, this person, Jesus. And, and that, that who is this, the prophet from Galilee, maybe sounds a little bit uh, uh, anticlimactic, but, but remember that, that who is this, it's not being asked in a vacuum, it's, it's who is this you're singing Hosanna about? Who is this who's coming in like the Messiah King? Oh, the one who's coming in like the King? It's Jesus. Right, the prophet from Galilee. See, so catching how his, his entrance into the city here is a, is, is, a, is a demonstration, a statement, you know, that he's Israel's true king? Well, the demonstration, it continues and gets ratcheted up a little bit in what happens next when he gets there. So let's, let's take a look at that. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. When the chief priests and teachers of the law said, saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. If you want to get an idea of, of just the significance of the temple to the Jews of this day, I think this drawing by, by N.T. Wright, the New Testament scholar, helps. You know, the, the, the Jews saw the temple as that place where where heaven, the realm of God, and earth, you know, the realm of people, uh, where those, those come together. You know, the idea is that God is, is most directly here for us when we're at the temple. And especially because what you do at the temple, what you do there is you offer sacrifices, right? Now, some people, when they came for the Passover, would bring their own uh, animal sacrifices, right? But, but if you had to come a long way, like these people from Galilee did, that, that wasn't very practical. So you could either, you could buy your sacrifice right there at the temple, or you could maybe buy it from some, somebody on the street, you know, some vendor. But the problem with that, the problem with going to, you know, whatever their equivalent of you know, Sam's Club was, where you can get things at, at a cut rate, you know, um, is that at the temple, the priests also had to certify that you're offering your, your animal sacrifice was without blemish. 
And they were much less likely to do that if you didn't buy your, your thing right there at the temple, right? And also, you had to buy, if you bought it at the temple, you had to use special coinage that was only available at the temple. So you had to exchange your money for the money that was used at the temple at whatever exchange rate, you know, the authorities there set. So, I mean, can you see how this is a whole system that's kind of ripe for abuse and corruption? It is for people who are going to worship God, right? And then on top of all this, the place where these people are, are, are doing this, where they're setting up their business of changing money and selling animals, is the court of the Gentiles. That's the only place in the area of the temple where non-Jews were allowed to go and hear the word of God being taught. Okay? And, um, and so when Jesus says, when he says, my house should be called a house of prayer, he's quoting a line from Isaiah 56, the full line of which says, a house of prayer for all nations. And so he's recalling He's recalling this passage from Israel's history that looked forward to a day when people from all over the world, you know, Gentiles, non-Jews, would come to worship Israel's God as the one true God. And yet, now the Gentiles are being squeezed out of their space. They, they, they can't come and hear the word of God being taught because it's all taken up by this, this, this marketplace here. Actually, if some of you were here a few years ago, Dave Valentine had a message on this. That was his main point. He was talking about how the Gentiles are being squeezed out here. So again, it's not just that um, it's corrupt in itself, but, but because of where they're doing this, they're getting in the way of witnessing to and ministering to outsiders, to the Gentiles. And so when Jesus goes in there and he, he flips over those tables and those, those benches, what he's doing is he's pronouncing judgment on this whole thing, right? And on, on the people who've allowed it to happen. He's also, you know, declaring his own authority to reform all this. But even more fundamentally, Jesus, in effect here, he's dismantling the whole sacrificial system. Because if you think about it, it's not just that these guys can't sell their stuff anymore, but the pilgrims coming in, they can't buy them anymore either. And so by his actions here, Jesus is in effect saying, hey, this whole sacrificial system, you know, for all its good scriptural you know, origins, it's become something corrupt, something abusive, something that's no longer pleasing to God. And you notice the positive things that he does there. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them, right? So what Jesus is showing here is he's showing that now the, the, the place where, where heaven and earth, right, where things of God and things of humanity, where they meet, it's, it's no longer in this building. It's no longer in this, this offering of sacrifices, but it's where people are being healed. It's where forgiveness is being dealt out. It's where Jews and Gentiles alike are being taught the true word of God. In other words, heaven and earth come together where Jesus is and in what, in what, he's, in what he's doing and teaching. And, and he's like a, a walking, breathing temple. And if you're a little bit versed in Christian theology, this is incarnation, right? It's, it's heaven and earth, God and humanity coming together in this person, Jesus. All right, let's, let's wind this down with a couple of takeaways here. For one, I think this is a great passage for the... The, the, the Jesus versus organized religion sermon, you know? you know? Jesus against the religious establishment. Jesus against the church. And uh, I used to love that sermon. I preached it a few times until I realized I am the religious establishment, you know? <laughs> uh, better, be, better be careful of that. Um, but Jesus does issue a real challenge here, I think, for churches, especially for leaders, of churches to be to be asking questions like you know have some of our traditions have some of our practices become you know kind of corrupt and self-serving you know are, are there ways that we do things that that kind of you know keep outsiders at bay keep them from from coming and hearing and engaging with with our good news message you know those are really good really important questions to ask the problem is when preachers try to answer them they get in trouble <laughs> Especially if you get specific, right? Because to name specific programs or traditions or practices, you're, you're stepping all over somebody's sacred cow, you know? You are. But let me tell you it anyway. <laughs> At least one example. Um, maybe some of you will recall that uh, for, for most of my time here, actually, at East Maine, and for almost all of our history at East Maine, I'm pretty sure for all of our history before that, 
we had a practice right smack dab in the middle of our worship service called the offering. Right? And what we did is, is, is these, these people called ushers would, would come down each row with these very fancy looking bags. And they'd pass the bag along the row and people put money in the bag. And, um, and by the way, there's good scriptural roots for this. In fact, I think you could probably say, especially in the Old Testament, that, that the offering is like the quintessential act of worship to be giving of what we have back to the Lord. Um, and, uh, and, and it's big in our Reformed Presbyterian tradition as well. You, any worship book you read in Reformed Presbyterian tradition, the offering is right there smack in the center of the worship service. Well, why did we stop doing it? We stopped doing it because of COVID, right? Didn't want people touching stuff and passing it all around, all these hands touching things. Well, COVID's over, so how come we don't have the offering anymore? <laughs> well, because today, as well-intentioned and, and biblically grounded as having an offering in the middle of a worship service might be, um, to pass around a bag for people to put money in is a stumbling block for a lot of people. Especially people who are like newer to the faith or people who are, are maybe you know, consider themselves like the Gentiles, outsiders, or just maybe trying to you know, dip their toe in the water a little bit to this church and Christianity stuff. Um, you know, it kind of sends a message that, well, it's a price of admission to come to church, you know? And, and plus, you know, maybe you've been in a situation where it, it can be a little embarrassing when the, the thing comes around and you know, the person next to you throws in a check and, and you take the bag and you pass it back to the usher and you go, you know, like that, you know, and, uh, and, and do you explain to the usher, you say, hey, um, you know, I, I only get paid every two weeks, and this is my week, you know, <laughs> or, or do you say, that, you know, well, I'm just one of those, those many people today that, that you know, doesn't carry cash and can't remember the last time I wrote a check, you know. <laughs> um, well, before we get too excited, though, about the, um, that Jesus versus the religious establishment sermon, um, <laughs> there's also a strong message here of Jesus versus the hopes and the dreams of regular people. You know, the hopes and the dreams we have for what we want God to, to be doing uh, for us. See, for ordinary Jews who were coming in for the Passover, many of them would also have been you know, pretty, pretty cynical uh, and fed up with the religious establishment. But they were very excited. They were like we were doing earlier. They were shouting Hosanna. They were, they were praising God as Jesus came in. Why? Because they were longing for a Messiah King to come. But the kind of Messiah King they were longing for was a warrior king like David. You know, somebody who was going to you know, restore their nation to military and economic greatness. In fact, I think, I think a lot of them, they, they had these hats that said M-I-G-A on them. Make Israel great again. You know? that's, that's what they wanted to do. You know, that's what they were hoping for. They wanted a Messiah who was going to do that, who's going to make them great again. And maybe that's what some of us want, you know? But, but even more of us, even more of us probably, even more than we want something for, you know, a nation, for a whole people, you know, we, we so long for, you know, God to at least make us personally healthy and happy, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, right? <laughs> we need to pick up on a clue, though, that, that the people then, a lot of them, seem to have missed, even though, even though Matthew gave them the reference. You know, Matthew is, is writing this. He's, he's seeing this years later. He's, he's quoting uh, from, you know, from Zechariah. You know, your king comes to you gentle and on a donkey. And see, the donkey was indication. It's not a war horse. He came in to conquer. You know, he was conquering here. He came on a war horse. When he came on a donkey, like David came when he came back from Hebron to reclaim, he came in peace, he came on a donkey. It means you're coming in peace, right? And gentle. Gentle? <laughs> well, gentle doesn't mean passive, right? It doesn't mean that. Um, and it certainly, you know, based on what Jesus did at the temple afterwards, it doesn't exclude pretty bold action either, does it? But I think gentle does suggest an approach to people that... Um, that maybe is a little different from the way a lot of us, a lot of us operate. And it also goes along with humility, doesn't it? Gentleness and humility kind of go together. Humility, not needing to get your own way. What I think, though, is, is maybe the most fundamental kind of call to action takeaway from these passages comes when we take very seriously the implications of what these scenes are telling us about who Jesus is. 
See, if Jesus really is now for us like what the temple was for the Jews of his day, the place, the person in whom heaven and earth meet, right? Well, this would mean that that people like us can become part of the answer to something we prayed a few moments ago when we prayed, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We can become part of the answer to that, friends, as we ourselves are walking in the ways of Jesus who brought heaven and earth together. Now, someday Jesus himself, with no help from any of us, is going to usher in the fullness of, of that kingdom, right? He's going to usher in the fullness. That's going to be when that new creation comes about, where, as the Revelation says, no more crying, no more pain, no more death, you know, no more sin, no more suffering, okay? That's going to happen. Jesus is going to bring that about without any help from us, right? But until that day, heaven and earth meet. God's kingdom comes into our world whenever and wherever we're living out Jesus' ways in our world. So, (laughs) when, where, with whom will you be living a little more (laughs) in the ways of Jesus this week? You know, with whom can you be a little more gentle? In what situation can you humble yourself and let somebody else get their way? Is there maybe a place where God is calling you to be a little bold in helping eliminate some barrier that's keeping somebody else from from really engaging with the Lord? Another way to put this would be in terms of what Jesus was declaring in the first part that, that Preston read, his entry into the city, his declaration there that he truly is the Messiah King. And by the way, the Zechariah passage and also the Psalm and the Isaiah passages are, are looking forward to a time uh, this, when this, this king, this, this peaceful king, was going to be a king not just of, of Israel, but king of everywhere. In other words, people were going to come from all over to worship Israel's king as the king of the world. Now, even saying that word king, we Americans, we don't do kings very well, do we? I mean, our whole history is about breaking free from, from being subjects to a king. I think that word, subject. See, if, if, if somebody is your king, you're his subject. That means you, you, you sort of, you're supposed to do what they say, right? Well, do we acknowledge Jesus as our king, right? Do we acknowledge him as our king? And are we his subjects? Are we his loyal subjects? How might we be more loyal subjects? Well, that includes stuff like we were talking about. Um, you know, gentleness, humility, boldness. It also means following him, not just in his victory parade, right? But following him on his journey to the cross, which was his destiny at the end of the week. You know? In other words, following him in, in suffering. So when we walk through suffering ourselves... Can we do that with confidence and with hope, you know, trusting that, that we're following the one who suffered on our behalf? And, and can we also walk with and enter into the suffering of other people you know, as witnesses to them of the one who suffered for us? See, friends, if Jesus really is the one in whom heaven, the realm of God, and earth, the realm of people come together, Let's be part of this this meeting (laughs) by walking in his ways. And if Jesus is is our true king, well, let's be be following in his ways as as loyal subjects. Well, let's let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that the place where heaven and earth meet is, is not in a building, it's not in, in, in something that, um, a ritual that we go through. It's in the person of Jesus who we can draw near to in prayer and who we can draw near to as we walk in his ways. And so Lord, give us grace to do that. Give us grace day by day to, in light of who he is as the one in whom heaven and earth meet, who he is as king, our king. Give us grace to, to be his subjects to be part of heaven and earth meeting in him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able